Greetings in that precious name of Jesus. I'm Bill Steger, and welcome to my study. It's time for our Sunday School lesson, and we finished the book of Romans last week, and so uh, this next quarter we'll be looking at the book of Proverbs and wisdom literature. So get your Bible and, and come join me. This is a fascinating study, and it's a study that we need to talk about a little bit before we start, because wisdom literature isn't quite like the, the rest of the studies in the Bible. You have to understand its format and, and how it is presenting the material, and uh, we want to do that. Proverbs forms one of the great blessings in life. There are many statements I've collected over the years that I felt were just really neat that described Proverbs. In fact, I was in high school and I heard Billy Graham say that every day he begins his day by reading five chapters in the book of Psalms and one chapter in the book of Proverbs. Those chapters in Psalms help him in his relationship with God and teach him how to pray. And that chapter in Proverbs teaches him how to relate to his fellow man. So you have the vertical and the horizontal dimension of our life reflected in those Ever since I heard him say that, I, I have tried to make sure that each day my Bible reading includes some Psalms and some Proverbs. Proverbs are things you want to chew on and, and think about. I once heard that the Proverbs were laws for, from heaven for life on earth. That they are words of the wise for the ways of the world. And that they are human wit with divine wisdom. Each one of those statements tells us just a little bit about what Proverbs are all about. Many people say, oh, they're a group of maxims. Yes, a maxim is a good description of it. A maxim means a, a short, pithy, memorable statement. But some of them are also epigrams. And epigrams is a word that means a short, pithy statement that is humorous or that is witty. And the Proverbs are filled with such wit. There are so many marvelous statements. I mean, who could not laugh about the woman of indiscretion who was like a pig with a jewel in his nose? You know, those are things that paint pictures for us and that we remember vividly and tell us a, a lot about our life. Our English word, proverb, is an interesting one. It's two Latin words, pro verba. Pro means for, and verba means words. So proverbs means for words. In other words, instead of a lengthy essay, here's a proverb. Instead of all those words, this proverb is short, and it's concise, and it's easy to think about, and maybe even memorize. And so Proverbs fall in, into that category. They cover every subject imaginable. And you're used to their short, pithy statements. So many of them are a contrast, a positive and a negative. I've just picked one subject and pulled out three Proverbs on that subject. In Proverbs 11.1, 1, we read, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A slightly different twist on the same subject in 16.11 says, A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. And then chapter 20, verse 23 says, Divers' weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. Taking one little subject like that and painting several pictures, some in contrast, the good versus the bad, some where the second line continues the discussion of the bad or the good. In the ancient world, in Solomon's day, money hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> In fact, it would be another 350, 400 years before the first coins would ever be invented. 
So merchants carried, as Proverbs said, a bag that contained the balance. That is, the way in which they were going to handle things. This is a case that has such a balance. It's portable and something that a, a, a merchant would use. This one's probably a, just a little more sophisticated than what would be present in Solomon's day, but it would act exactly the same. Here we go. Now, he would get out his balance when you were ready to make your purchase, and you came with your nuggets of different kinds of precious metals. It might be copper, it might be bronze, it might be silver, it might be gold, just depending on what you were buying. And then he had his weights, big ones like that, and I've got a little case that has little tiny wafers of different sizes as well that are in there. And uh, he would put his weight on that side, and you would pour your dust or nuggets in this side until the needle registered in the middle and it was balanced. That's the way in which we're talking about. Now, there's a lot of ways to cheat on such a system as this. I can remember as a little boy growing up in a German community, and my grandmothers, every single day, they went shopping to bet fresh bread and just a handful of this, that, and the other. And I can remember we would go to Charlie the Butcher's. And uh, my grandmother would say, I want so much hamburger or so much butter that he would cut from a block behind the counter. And uh, as he cut it and put it on the scale, she said, now get your thumb off that scale. Or she'd look underneath to make sure he hadn't put a blob of hamburger underneath to make it way heavier. It's so easy to cheat like that. And so she would constantly look out for every single detail. And that's what Proverbs is talking about. How it's important for us to deal honestly with our fellow man. And that make sure what's in that bag of weights, that balance that we have, is something that you can count on. That it's just and that it's fair, and that uh, you're not cheating anybody. Well, not all the Proverbs are going to be about balances. But I want to talk just a little bit about the book itself. Look at the first verse of Proverbs with me. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Well, there's no doubt about it. Solomon is the author of these Proverbs. Do you remember back in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verse 9, where God tells Solomon, ask me whatever you want. And Solomon asks for, do you remember what he asked for? He asked for wisdom. Not wealth, not power, not authority, not a luxurious life, but he wanted wisdom. Well, God not only poured out a lot of wisdom into that man, Scripture says he was the wisest man of his time, but he also blessed him in many other ways. He says, because you didn't ask for wealth, I'm going to give it to you. Because you didn't ask for power, I'm going to grant it to you. So God was willing to recognize the real potential in Solomon because of the natural wisdom he displayed. Now when we come to the book of Proverbs. This is a collection of collections. In verse 1, I've showed you that it says these are the Proverbs of Solomon. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, it says the same thing. Here are some more Proverbs of Solomon. And then in chapter 25, verse 1, it says, here are the Proverbs of Solomon that Hezekiah's men copied out. This is hundreds of years after Solomon's life as a Kaya was king in 700 B.C., and uh, his men found some more Proverbs of Solomon, and that shouldn't surprise us. After all, the, the book of 1 Kings chapter 4, 31 and 32 tells us that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs. <laughs> we don't have 3,000 Proverbs here. In fact, the book we now have, the first nine chapters, has very few proverbs in it. The first nine chapters are discussions of a father to his son. 
They are a challenge to understand brief aspects of important parts of growing up in this world. They are essays, if you will, dealing with many subjects. Chapters 10 through 26 or 7, they are the typical kind of proverbs, and they contain 375 proverbs, short, pithy statements. And at the very end, in chapter 30, we have the proverbs of a fellow named Augur, and we're not sure who he was. And then in chapter 31, we have a guy named Lemuel, and his mother taught him some things in that poem of the virtuous woman. Most scholars today feel that Lemuel was another name for Solomon. So we have a collection of problems, in fact, a collection of collections that forms the basic book. In Solomon's day, wisdom was something that was honored and taught. But in the book of Proverbs, wisdom begins with the knowledge of God. That makes me think. In Genesis 3, 6, we read that Satan tempted Eve, and he talked about that tree. You remember that? He said its fruit would make you wise. He told Eve that she could have wisdom by eating that fruit. He was deceptive. Solomon says it's, it's not about eating fruit. He says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom. That's from verse 7, and that's the key verse to the whole book. You see, real wisdom doesn't come from a fruit tree, and it doesn't come from this world. It comes from the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is a relationship with God. In fact, I need to spend just a moment defining that term. Throughout the Old and the New Testament, we see many times this expression, the fear of the Lord, and sometimes the expression, the fear of God. The two of them mean basically the same thing. If you will read each time that phrase occurs you will begin to understand what Scripture means by it. There are two parts to the meaning of the fear of the Lord. We're not talking about cowering in a corner and shivering and shaking and quaking. But instead, fear of the Lord means a reverence and awe for the majesty and the greatness of God. But there's more to it. That is the passive aspect of the fear of the Lord, we begin to sense the majesty, the reverence, the greatness, the awesomeness of God. But it moves us to do something. And when you read each of the passages determined in, uh, is found in Scripture, you'll see what it moves us to do is obedience and service. So if you ask me to define the fear of the Lord, I would say it is a reverence and awe for the Lord that leads to obedience and service. And we'll see that played out in the passages we'll look at today. The reason for that term is that the Hebrew people were not abstract theologians. They weren't deep, complicated philosophers. They didn't even have a, a word in their language for religion. Religion was too abstract a term for them. Therefore, their term for religion is the fear of the Lord. And it is an action word. It is a reverence and awe for God, something you do. It is something that brings you to obedience and service, something you do. They see life in terms of verbs, in terms of actions. In fact, the verb is the basic part of every Semitic language. And Hebrew even describes God in terms of verbs. We talk about him in terms of nouns. We talk about his holiness and his righteousness and his omnipotence and his omnipresence. And all those things are true. But the Hebrew would prefer to use verbs. 
When Moses met God on Mount Sinai in the wilderness of the burning bush, and as God spoke to him from the bush, he said, I am the Lord who sees. I'm the Lord that hears the affliction. I'm the Lord who comes down. I'm the Lord who delivers. I'm the Lord who leads out. All of those are action words. And that's the way God describes himself. Therefore, the Hebrew concept of what real religion is all about, what real faith is all about, it's not head knowledge. It's not a philosophy. It's not even a theology. It is an action. It is a reverence and awe for God that moves me to obedience and service. Wow, what a way to begin our study. Proverbs is what we call wisdom literature. We have three books in the Bible, in the, New, in the Old Testament, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon that are called wisdom literature, and the book of Job, I'm sorry. Uh, in the New Testament, we also have one that usually the book of James is considered like Proverbs, a bunch of short, pithy statements. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. That's the way the Proverbs spell things out so clearly and so specifically. It was an ancient form of teaching. We're going to read how the elders sat at the city gate and, and they gave off wisdom with their judgments and their decisions and their statements. The Hebrew word for proverb is a mashal, and it literally means to be like, to compare this is like that, or sometimes negatively, this is not like that. Okay, So many of the proverbs are these comparisons. We talked about a woman of indiscretion is like a pig with a gem in his nose. So that's comparing one thing to another. And that's what Proverbs do for us. They form very brief commands, sometimes prohibitions, and they all focus on our conduct and our character. You see, our faith is not about rituals. It is about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that transforms our life and gives us a totally different character. We begin to get a new mind, a new way of thinking. We begin to get a new way of relating. We spent the last part of our studies in Romans talking about I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's action. It's not ritual. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds. So our faith requires us to let the Spirit retrain our minds and our thinking. And as a result of that retraining and learning, we discover a better way of relating to God and to one another. And Proverbs is a practical expression of putting that into action. In the ancient world, there were three basic types of intellectual leaders in ancient Israel. I think Jeremiah 18.18 18 kind of says it best of all when he says, For the law shall not depart from the priests, that's the first, nor counsel from the wives, that's the second, nor the word from the prophet, that's the third. The three groups of intellectual leaders in the ancient world in Solomon's day and the Jeremiah's day were the priest, the wise man, and the prophet. Each one of them had a different method of dealing with it. The priest, Jeremiah says, the law shall not depart from the priest. The priest was a conservator. He was trying to preserve and conserve the law, the law of God. Then he says, counsel from the wise. The wise men were applicators. They tried to apply the word of God to everyday life. So they gave counsel. And then you have the prophet. 
And it was the word that the prophet focused on. I mean, over and over again, you read the prophet says, Thus saith the Lord. He is a restorator. He's trying to bring a wayward people back to the word of the Lord, back to what God had given in the law, back to living lives of obedience. So we have the priest, the conservators, the wise men, the applicators, and the prophets, the restorators. So here Solomon has collected these proverbs, which represent the application of the truths God has given us into everyday life. And that concept of application is critical for us to gain and to understand. There are many topics sprinkled throughout this book. I can't begin to number them all. I, I, they deal, yes, like we've been talking about, wisdom, but they talk about sin, talk about the tongue, talk about pride, talk about uh, idleness, talk about love, talk about pleasure, talk about success and temperance and friendship and morals of all kinds. There are so many subjects because it covers the avenues of life. And so many times these are placed in comparisons, like we've mentioned. There's comparison of man with God, time with eternity, truth with falsehood, wealth with poverty, purity with impurity, justice with injustice, pleasure with misery, industry with laziness, you know, godliness with ungodliness, and the list goes on and on of a contrast with one another. And so many proverbs are just filled with those contrasts to set in our minds and teach us a new character, a new way of behaving, a new way of living. And finally, there are many, many evil people spoken about in Proverbs. You're going to meet one of them today. He's called the fool, and he's sprinkled all over the place in Proverbs. And we have to watch out for him. But there's also the tail bearer, and the whisperer, and the backbiter, and the lustful one, and the boaster, and the speculator, and the sluggard, and the, and the list keeps on going. There's all kinds of people that we have to be careful of not becoming and watch our behavior. Social relationships are discussed. You know, we have masters and servants and rich and the poor and husband and wife and parents and children and teachers and students and friends and, and enemies. There's, there's all kinds of relationships that are spelled out for us here as well. The Proverbs is something that you and I need to be reading every single day. How do you read them? slowly, carefully. A whole chapter is a big chunk. When you finish the first nine chapters, which are those short essays, and you get from chapter 10 to the end of the book, you're in basically the short Proverbs. And if you read just two or three of them each day, and think about them, there's more to them than just those two lines. Each one of them is a complete unit of thought, and they make us think about possibilities. They're not absolute promises that if you do this, guaranteed, that's going to happen. No, they have take into account the fact that, that we live in a world that has to be understood individually. Let me give you an example. Proverbs 26, verse 4, says this, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he also be like unto him. Now that's an interesting point. Don't answer a fool the way he talks, or you're going to just be like him. I can see that. That's something I need to learn. But wait a minute. Listen to the next verse, verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. My goodness. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to answer a fool according to his folly, or not answer a fool according to his folly? Those of you that have been parents and have had more than one child understand that proverb. You realize that every child's different. 
And what worked for this child didn't work for that one. And you had to rethink and, and wrestle with each child individually and realize you, you depended on the Holy Spirit to give you guidance and direction. You took the basic principles that God has given you, but the application of them was slightly different in each individual's life. And that's what many of the problems are talking about. It's not a guarantee that if you don't answer a fool according to his folly, that's going to solve the problems. Or the opposite, that if you do answer a fool. But rather it's saying, here are two basic principles. If you answer a fool like his folly, then here's the problem. You're going to become like him. So be careful. If you don't answer a fool according to his folly, then he's going to feel he gets away with it, and he's going to be wise in his own conceit. So be careful. Both proverbs are true. They need to be applied appropriately. That's why wisdom can't be a list of rules. Wisdom has to be a relationship with God. For it's from that relationship that we begin to understand the flow and the meaning of truths and able to apply them appropriately. Like Paul says, you know, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. We have to take it and apply this to this and that to that and realize what we're dealing with. We have to recognize people as individuals. Now, enough of that back introductory material. Let's look at that first chapter. I've divided the first chapter into three big paragraphs. They're voices. The first paragraph is, is one through nine, and it's the voice of parents teaching. The voice of parents teaching. And then the second paragraph begins in verse 10, and it goes through verse 19, and it's the voice of folly tempting the voice of folly, tempting. And the final paragraph, verses 20 through 33, is the voice of wisdom, pleading. It's the voice of wisdom, pleading. And you'll hear those voices. Let's look at the first one, chapter 1. I've already read the first verse about the authorship being Solomon. But now the parents' teaching. To know wisdom instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Those three verses define the purpose for Proverbs, that this is instruction to young people. Oh, those of us that are not so young, we need to listen too, but we've lived most of our life. We have made our bed already, but the young, they need to receive this knowledge that needs to be passed on to a new generation. Verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So his advice to the youth, or listen, your parents have something to teach you because they're older, they're more experienced, they've been walking with the Lord a little bit longer. And there is some practical knowledge we call wisdom, not head knowledge, but practical knowledge about everyday living that needs to be transmitted Solomon uses a word, a wise man will hear. You're going to hear that word many times in the book of Proverbs. It's an important word. And the word hear is an interesting word. It doesn't mean just to listen. In the Bible, the word hear means to listen with the intent to obey. As a young boy, I can still hear my mother. She'd be working in the kitchen, and I'd hear that voice, Billy, do such and such. And, of course, nothing would happen. Five minutes later, the voice would come again. This time, it was a little bit louder. Billy, do such and such. 
and nothing happened at all. And then a few minutes later, all of a sudden you'd hear a very strong voice and you'd feel a vibration in the floor as a foot hit the floor and said, Billy, do you hear me? And when she said that, do you hear me? I knew she wasn't talking about did I catch those vibrations on my tympanic membrane. She was asking, are you going to obey? And that's what this word means. This word to hear means to listen with the intent to obey. That's why Jesus ends so many of his parables by saying, He that hath ears, let him hear. And in those seven letters that he dictates to John to the seven churches in Asia, every one of them ends, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Hearing was important the greatest commandment that the Jews recognized that Jesus talked about in Matthew 22 comes from Deuteronomy 6. And it is Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohinu, Yahweh Ahab. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear! That is a call to action, not just listening. It's a call to behavior not just listening. It's a call to obedience, not just listening. It's a call to service, not just listening. So that's what Solomon gets at. Let's look now at verse 6. To understand a proverb, the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, and by dark he means deep, mysterious, things that are more than just surface meaning that there is a message that lurks there that you need to chew on for a little while. And then here it comes, the key to the whole book. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, Satan tempts Eve. And he says, here's a fruit that will make you wise. If only Eve had known this proverb. Wisdom doesn't come from a fruit. It doesn't come from the world. It comes from that relationship with God. And I cannot emphasize that enough. And that's what the key here is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And only a fool is going to turn away that wisdom that God wants to bring. And then once again in verse 8, Solomon says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, for snake sake not the law of thy mother. The parents, mom and dad, pleading with this young man, listen to what we've got to say. For they shall be as ornaments of grace upon thy head, and a chains about thy neck. Chains about my neck. What are we talking about? In the ancient world, the Egyptians were always admired. And after all, the Hebrews had spent 400 years down there in Egypt. And they had seen anybody of importance had chains about his neck. In fact, you've seen pictures of the great big wide gold collars that Egyptian pharaohs wore. They were eight to ten inches wide when all around them, like um, Mr. T and his chains that he used to wear. It was a symbol of authority, a symbol of power, a symbol of wealth. In fact, when Joseph was taken out of prison and placed before Pharaoh and, and interpreted his dreams and was set up in office. He was given those chains. And Solomon says, you want to be a man of real authority? It'll happen with wisdom. It'll happen when you learn that fear of the Lord is the beginning of that wisdom. Now, after we finish that uh, ninth verse, we begin to hear the voice, a different voice, not the parents this time. Oh, Dad's telling the story, but he's talking and warning them about the temptation of folly. Verse 10 through 19, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent them not. 
If they say, come with us and let us lay wait for blood and let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause and let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit, we shall find all precious substances. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Do you hear the temptation of folly? He's saying, come join our gang. We're going to go looting and burning and fill up our houses with a spoil. And Solomon tells his son, well, let's listen to what he tells him in that next verse, verse 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Don't join that gang. Refrain thy foot from their path. Don't even go where they're going. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Even a bird notices a trap. You can be smarter than that. Don't go running after this gang and get into trouble, son. And they that wait for their own blood, they lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Oh, the foolishness of allowing the world's insane desire for wealth to captivate us. How it can move us to hook up with the wrong company and get us into all kinds of trouble. Well, from the voice of the parents to the voice and temptation from folly, the last section, 26 to the end, <coughs> is the voice of wisdom pleading with us to make wise decisions. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words. You can hear wisdom speak everywhere. She's in the main marketplace in all the malls. She's even at the courthouse in the ancient world. The city gates were basically like our courthouse. Tucked into the huge entrance of a gate, in fact we call it, an archaeologist call it a Solomonic gate, has three partitions and in between those partitions are separate little rooms and there were benches there and that's where the elders sat and that's where they held court. Everyone who walked in and out of the city through the city of a gate could hear and listen to the dispensing of justice. They could hear the wisdom of the elders. So that's his reference to what goes on at the city gates here. In verse 22, how long, you simple ones, where you love simplicity, how long are you going to be stupid and look for the easy road that leads to destruction? This is not the way you earn a living. This is not the way you build up wealth. This is not the way you enjoy life, is to run after the world's desires and the crowd. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. As wisdom cries out, she wants so much to pour the very message, the Spirit of God, into people's lives that they might understand and make wise decisions and that they might come from a sense of uh, knowledge and understanding. Verse 24, Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But you have set it not all my counsel, and you would none of my repute. You have not listened to a thing I have said. You have not taken any of my advice. You ready? There are consequences. Yes. There are consequences for us not fearing the Lord and listening to his wisdom. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. 
when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. The New Testament says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And here wisdom is saying, you know what? Your day's coming. You didn't accept any of my advice. You didn't listen to any of my counsel. But I'm going to laugh just like you've laughed at me. I'm going to laugh when you stand before the judge and your day of destruction comes like a whirlwind upon you. Then shall they call upon me and I'll not answer. And they shall seek me, but they'll not find me. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about such a tragedy. He says that at the time of judgment, there'll be many saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name and that in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. You've never built that fear of the Lord. You've never entered into a relationship with me. No. Verse 29. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose. Here it is. The fear of the Lord. It's all about that intimate, personal relationship with God that grows from a reverence and respect and moves to obedience and service. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way. Yes, there'll be another apple tree to pick from. And it leads to destruction, absolute destruction. Their fruits will demonstrate the problem and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple shall slay them. And the prosperity of the fools shall destroy them. Even though they've filled their houses with the loot and spoil they've made, they'll find it only leads to destruction. And it'll ruin them. It'll destroy them. And then that final verse. But whoso hearkeneth unto me, shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. The paragraph ends with a, with a promise, a blessing. If we will only listen to God's voice of wisdom. There's three things I want to leave you with this morning. You've heard the voice of parents teaching. To those of you who are parents or grandparents or work with youth in any way, what are you teaching them? What are you placing before them? What kind of voice do they hear? Is the message clear? Does it explain what the fear of the Lord is all about? That relationship with God. The world... The world is that voice of folly that tempts. Don't ignore the issues. Solomon took time to explain to his son what that voice sounds like. And you're going to hear it in those first nine chapters over and over again. That voice draws a child or a youth to adultery, to immorality, to all kinds of problems and sin in his life. Solomon doesn't hide that stuff from his children and say, oh, I don't want to talk about evil. He discusses it. He said, this is what's going to happen out there in the world. These are the real temptations you're going to experience in life. Be honest with your children. Solomon was with his. My son, hear my voice. Listen to what your mother said. This is the way life is and it's going to tempt you. And then what is that voice of wisdom you're giving them? Pleading with them. And yes, it takes a lot of pleading. Pour your relationship with Christ into the hearts and lives of others with a clear and certain voice. God bless you.